I thank the program chairs for inviting me to give this plenary lecture. It's been a great honor. My talk today is on progress in the field of nano-engineered energetic materials. This field has had enormous growth internationally over the last 25 years, as evident by the nearly exponential growth in yearly publications related to this topic. As such, my talk is not a review of all the excellent research that's been done but somewhat of a roadmap of the implementation of nanomaterials into bulk energetic materials, such as propellants and explosives. I'll first introduce the subject of nanoenergetics, emphasizing why the nanoscale and identifying some of the limiting attributes. Then I'll show types of approaches to assemble materials from the nanoscale to the macroscale, and finish by discussing necessary modeling and experimental studies to advance the field. One of the reasons for the interest in nanoenergetics is the limited advancements and energy densities of organic energetic materials. This is a plot of the detonation velocity of carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen-based energetic materials as a function of year of development. Note that the detonation velocity, or essentially the energy density, asymptotes over time and has not increased significantly over the last 70 years. During this period, many other energetic compounds have been synthesized, but are either too sensitive, too costly, or too difficult to manufacture and have not seen bulk production or usage. Octonitrocubane, which is shown in the upper right, is one such example with the highest theoretical detonation velocity. This historical trend also illustrates the well-known correlation that exists between energy density and sensitivity of a material. As a consequence, there's been significant interest into how to better manage, manipulate, and control energy release rates of energetic materials specific to each application. It's also been recognized for some time now that the addition of metals to composite energetic materials has been one approach to increase energy densities. This view graph shows the heats of oxidation on both a gravimetric and volumetric basis for many metals and compares them to those of JP4 and hydroxyl terminated polybutadiene, which is a typical binder in composite propellants. As can be seen from the chart, the volumetric densities of many of the metals are two to four times greater than those of JP4 or HTPB. Aluminum is the most common metal additive, while boron is often the most desirable. Generally, the metals are added to energetic formulations in particulate form that are tens of micron in diameter. In a typical operating pressures of systems, the combustion of micron-sized particles is diffusion controlled and ignition and combustion times can be long. To shorten these times, investigation of nanomaterials as energetic materials has become of interest. Some of the characteristics of nanoparticles are shown here and include shorter mixing times, smaller thermal capacitance, increased specific surface area, increased reactivity and catalytic activity, lower melting and vaporization temperatures, lower sintering temperatures, and many others. Many of the extraordinary characteristics of nanoparticles listed here can be attributed to the excess energy of the surface atoms. This is a plot of the percent of atoms in the bulk versus on the surface as a function of particle diameter for iron. Below about 20 nanometers, the importance of surface atoms increases dramatically. Because surface atoms have a lower coordination, in other words, more dangling bonds, the electrical and thermal physical properties are vastly different than those of the bulk atoms. For example, gold particles are known to be inert at the macro scale, yet act as excellent catalysts at the one to five nanometer scale. Some examples of the resulting changes in thermodynamic properties are shown in this slide for the melting point temperature in the left figure and the heat of fusion in the right figure for 10 nanoparticles. Notice the significant changes again when diameters are reduced below about 20 nanometers. Boiling point temperatures and heats of vaporization are affected in a similar fashion. Because nanooxide particles also have significant amounts of surface atoms with dangling bonds, the energetics of oxidation are also affected. This plot shows how the heat of oxidation for aluminum changes with particle size depending on whether the original nanoparticle forms a nanooxide particle or a bulk oxide particle. As you can see from the plot on the left, if a nanooxide particle is formed, the heats of oxidation are much smaller than if bulk alumina is formed. 
which is a consequence of changes in the size-dependent lattice energies between the nano and bulk material. The plot on the right effectively shows that agglomeration of product particles can recover the bulk or even higher heats of oxidation. Moving from right to left on this plot corresponds to particle-particle bonding during agglomeration and hence loss of dangling bonds. When considering nanoparticles, one also needs to look at the naturally occurring passivating oxide layer that covers the particle surface, preventing it from becoming pyrophoric. For aluminum nanoparticles, this oxide coating typically has a thickness of about three nanometers at room temperature, which essentially represents dead weight with respect to the energy density of the particle. As shown in this figure, which is a plot of energy content versus particle diameter, when the particle diameter is 50 nanometers, there's approximately a 30% loss in energy content. As a consequence, one of the early areas of research in nanoenergetics was on coatings, self-assembled monolayers, and the development of composite nanoparticles that limit the volume of non-energetic material. This view graph provides a brief historical perspective of early energetic nanoparticle development. The development of nanoaluminum particles, shown in the upper left, began in Russia and in the U.S. in the mid-1990s. During the early 2000s, interest also developed in downsizing the length scales of crystalline oxidizers. Shown here are nanoparticles of RDX formed via the rapid expansion of a supercritical fluid. Many of the other crystalline oxidizers I showed earlier, including CL20 and HMX, have also been produced at the nanoscale using bone milling or the rest processing technique. The center column of photograph shows two examples of encapsulated aluminum and iron nanoparticles, where the attached ligands are hydrocarbon chains. Important functions of the ligands are the bonding of the chain at the head end and the functionality at the tail end. The ability of the ligands to prevent oxidation has been found to depend on their bond strength with the metal or metal oxide and on their ability to prevent oxidizer from diffusing between the ligands themselves. The tail functionalization affects particle stability and viscosity, for example, when added to liquids. While early particle passivation strictly added more fuel to the particle, interest quickly changed to whether the ligands themselves could include an oxidizer. The third column here shows particles where the attached ligands included either fluorine or oxygen as oxidizers. In the top photograph, a fluorocarbon is bound to the aluminum surface through a carboxyl group. Here, the fluorine acts as the oxidizer forming exothermic aluminum fluoride upon reaction. Even if the fluorocarbon were bound to a thin oxide layer instead of directly to the aluminum, the fluorine is effective in reducing this oxide layer exothermically and efficiently. In the bottom figure, cryogel formed particles with nanoaluminum and nitrocellulose are shown. These latter two examples are analogous to a metallized composite propellant that you'd find in a rocket motor. Here, the fuel is a metal nanoparticle, the binder is the ligand passivating the surface, and the oxidizer is functionalization added to the tail end of, of the ligand or side chains. The initial combustion studies on nanoparticles and energetic materials simply involved replacement of micron-sized particles for nano-sized particles. This slide shows results of such a substitution in a composite propellant consisting of hydroxyl terminated polybutadiene and ammonium perchlorate. On the left are photographs of the propellant strands burning with micron-sized aluminum and the same propellant combusting with an equal mass loading of nanoaluminum. The surfaces of the propellant are identified by the horizontal lines in each photograph. In the case of the micron aluminum, the aluminum burns far from the surface whereas the nanoaluminum, because of its lower ignition temperature, burns closer to the surface, increasing heat feedback, and hence the burning rate of the propellant. The figure on the right shows typical increases in the burning rate of a propellant as a function of pressure. In this case, 50% of the original micron aluminum was replaced with an equal mass of nanoaluminum. Close-up images of burning AP-based propellants indicate that even better performance is attainable with the nanoparticles. Typical of micron particles, as shown in the figure on the left, the particles at the surface accumulate in pockets in between the much larger AP particles, and depending on the conditions at the surface, aggregate to form agglomerates. 
The gas evolved at the surface lifts the agglomerates from the surface, which subsequently burn as individual particles with a detached diffusion flame. In the case of the nanoaluminum particles, as shown on the right, the particles emerge from beneath the surface as already centered aggregates that can continue to grow while residing on or prior to leaving the surface. While heat is released close to the surface, any unburnt portion of the particles when they're carried away burn with characteristic dimensions considerably larger than the nanometer scale. These results are also consistent with reactive molecular dynamics calculations that show sintering times to occur on the same time scale as reaction times, which may be why burning times of small particles are only weakly dependent on particle diameter. This plot shows the burning times of metal particles as a function of diameter for aluminum. The results show for diameters generally larger than 50 microns, particles burn with a diameter dependence close to d squared, the classical limit for diffusion controlled combustion, or in other words, a, a small damp color number. With decreasing particle size, a change in burning time dependence from d squared to d to the one is predicted from simple theory and indicates a transition from diffusion to kinetically controlled combustion or large damp color number. Interestingly, the experimental results in this figure show as the particle sizes decrease, the burning time dependence on diameter does not reside between d squared and d1, but is considerably smaller. In fact, a dependence of approximately d to the 0.3 is obtained. This lower dependence has been attributed to several factors, including misrepresentation of the actual particle size due to active sintering and particle aggregation during experimentation, as for example in the previous slide, the fractal dimensions of the particle aggregates, the small particle size relative to molecular spacing, that is a large Knudsen number which affects heat transfer and purely transient burning of a nanoparticle. It has been predicted and measured under some environmental conditions that the, the burning of small particles can have particle temperatures greatly exceeding the ambient temperature, which has been attributed to very low heat transfer rates due to small energy accommodation coefficients and hence a small free molecular conduction heat transfer coefficient. While a single explanation for these results has yet to be achieved, it's evident that many factors affect how a nanoparticle will burn. In addition, nanoparticle burning times are typically obtained from particle luminosity measurements, which can be influenced by phase changes and the high energy release with only a small percentage of particle consumption. Difficulties in interpreting ex experimental data have put more emphasis on predictive modeling, which remains a limitation hindering progress in nanoenergetics. Two other major constraints that have limited further investigation, characterization, and implementation of nanomaterials are due to one, their nanometer scale dimensions in the inherently high surface areas that reduce their usability. In particular, similar solid loadings cannot be achieved as those with micron sized particles. And secondly, particle particle interactions dominate, making the dispersion of the particles nearly impossible. To realize the benefits of nanoparticles and nanostructures and energetic materials, new approaches of integration had to be undertaken. From a materials design perspective, there's much to be gained in the actual performance, multifunctionality, and controllability of nano engineered energetic materials. It's well known that many biological and physical objects derive their unique properties through an integrated multi-length scale organization of their constituent and nano and microscale structures. A common feature in all these structures is that the nanoscale units are all integrated into micron to macro scale structures and are all accessible as individual modules for rapid response. For example, the strength of calcified bones, the gravity defying stickiness of the feet of geckos, the color and hydrophobicity of butterfly wings and the color of opal gemstones are some of the examples of functional manifestations arising from the hierarchical organization of nanostructures. Such multi-scale structures are being increasingly exploited to engineer devices such as adhesive mi mimicking the spatula of a gecko and poor silicon drug delivery systems. Hence, the question arises how hierarchical organization of nanostructures may be exploited in reactive energetic materials. 
This slide illustrates approaches for building bulk energetic materials. First, nanoparticles are assembled to the nanocomposites, which are then assembled to the micron scale. The micron scale particles are currently assembled to the macro scale using conventional fabrication methods and are being researched for assembly to the macro scale using additive manufacturing with the eventual goal to have control from the nanoscale and up. The procedures for synthesizing nanoparticles are well developed and include, for example, electric explosion of wires, vaporization and condensation methods, wet chemistry, mechanical attrition, and flame synthesis. Nanocomposite particles have been encapsulated with polymers and other metals. In the case of polymers, carboxylic acids, alkyl halides, alkyl substituted epoxides, and azides have all been used as ligands. Aluminum, boron, magnesium, titanium, zirconium, and silicon have all been encapsulated. Here, generally, the, the ligands with larger chain lengths and greater hydrophobicity have had greater stability. Most of the ligands are from off the shelf and have not been optimized for a particular application. They're generally selected first for the bonding at the head end and secondly for their functionalization at the tail end, for example, again, to make stable colloids. More effort is definitely needed on the synthesis of the ligands, particularly to adjust their energy content and reactivity. In addition, we need to better understand the uncapping temperatures and the associated reaction mechanisms. In the case of encapsulation by a secondary metal, most studies have been performed with micron particles. Much less work has considered nanoparticles. However, nanoaluminum has been coated with nickel, palladium, and boron. The research that has been conducted has shown it can be difficult to achieve thin coatings as bowling on the surface occurs yielding insufficient coverage and hence thick coatings are necessary resulting in lower overall heats of oxidation. Although if an intermetallic reaction is established, ignition times can be reduced. We know decreasing particle size has a positive impact on ignition and combustion rates. Thus a question remains as to how small of a particle one can have that could still contribute to the energy density of an energetic material and yield fast reaction rates. An area of research that has seen some attention over the last 10 years is the use of energetic metallic clusters as an ingredient and primary building block to larger scales. This research was initiated by the synthesis of the aluminum 77 cluster by Schnuckel and the development of the metal halide co-condensation reactor. The aluminum 77 cluster shown at the top left consists of nested shells containing 13, 44, and 20 aluminum atoms. Metal clusters have unique reaction characteristics where the addition of one atom can change the reaction chemistry. For example, the addition of one aluminum atom to a small cluster of say 13 can change the cluster from having no reaction with oxygen to one having a fast reaction. Shown at the bottom left are two low valent metal clusters that have been synthesized and studied in oxidation and combustion environments. Reaction between the tetramer capped with pentamethyl cyclopentadienyl and oxygen was found to occur by oxygen insertion into the aluminum core, and thus it preceded the oxidation of the ligand shell, making its reaction chemistry different from larger nanoparticles. When the bromine tetramer was added to liquid fuels, droplet combustion occurred by internal gas generation, droplet inflation, and continuous micro explosions during the entire burning process, producing shorter burning times by about 15 to 20 percent, which again also differs mechanistically when nanoparticles and surfactants are added to burning of liquid droplets. The research to date has demonstrated that ambient condition stability of metalloid clusters in a suspension is possible, indicating the potential of these clusters as an ingredient in energetic materials. As a community, we've made significant progress in the synthesis of nanoparticles and nanocomposite particles, as I've just shown. However, a goal now has been to assemble these particles to the microscale while preserving the benefits of the nanoscale ingredients. I now want to show a few approaches that have been researched to accomplish this. This slide illustrates a bottom-up approach that produces mesoparticles through an electrospray process. 
Electrospray is a simple method for fabrication of micron particles based on the breakup of a liquid jet under the influence of a strong electric force. As shown in the upper left, the technique starts with a solution of nanoparticles, solvent, and dissolved binder. The electrospray creates small droplets in which the solvent rapidly evaporates, leaving behind gelled microparticles consisting of an interstitial binder and nanoparticles. The interstitial binder can be fuel or energetic itself and acts as a gas generator. The photographs at the bottom left show examples of micron particles produced consisting of nanoaluminum and nitrocellulose, nanoaluminum and ammonia perchlorate, and nanoaluminum and RDX. As can be seen, the particles are uniform with a narrow size distribution. In addition, the electrospray process allows control of the composition, size, and morphology. The concept behind the design here is shown on the right side, where the binder prevents the nanoparticle from sintering during heating and initial reaction of the binder. Heat loss from the mesoparticle is governed by the microscale, allowing for heat to accumulate within the particle. Upon gasification of the binder, the soft agglomerates break apart and separate the nanoparticles, allowing them to react individually. In this example, the mesoparticles were injected into the post-combustion gases of a methane air diffusion flame. Burning times at different temperatures and with mesoparticles having different weight percentages of binder were studied. The burning times were also compared to those of nanoaluminum, where uncontrolled agglomeration of the nanoparticles caused a wider burning time distribution. As can be seen from the photographs on the left and the tabulated results, the burning times of the mesoparticles are considerably shorter, at least in order of magnitude. Here, the decomposing nitrocellulose binder mitigates reactive sintering, and as seen on the right, combustion times begin to recover the D to the 1 curve. In addition to this bottom-up approach, which is one example, top-down approaches have also been successful in preserving the nanostructure within the micron particles. As shown here, high energy bowl milling or mechanical attrition is a top-down process that's been used to create micron particles with nanoscale inclusions. The process starts with milling micron particles, which is arrested prior to a self-sustaining reaction to yield the nanostructured micron particles. A wide range of materials have been produced, including intermetallics, thermites, and polymer inclusions. Liquid surfactant addition and grinding media and time are used to adjust the final particle size and internal structure of the particles. Each individual particle has the same composition as the bulk with a density near the theoretical maximum. The SEM images in the lower right of the slide show an example for a starting mixture of aluminum and moly trioxide and the resulting composite particle where the nanostructure of the moly trioxide is evident. Now, in the, in the case of an intermetallic or thermite composite, while the heat release between the two components is important for ignition, consideration of the overall heat release in an oxidation environment should also be considered. This plot from Driesen shows the trade-off in the heat of reaction between the particle components versus the heat of oxidation for the entire composite. For aluminum, only mixtures with boron and lithium produce a higher heat of oxidation than aluminum, but unfortunately, there's essentially no heat release from these pairs. The lines on the plot indicate addition of the second component to the pure metal with the most bright point corresponding to the stoichiometric mixture. While there can be a significant loss in the overall heat of oxidation with the added component, note that many of these pairs still exceed the heat of reaction for that of TNT. Obviously, depending on application, molecular weights of the products are also important to consider. As you can see in this plot, with aluminum, mixtures of polytetrafluoroethylene, PTFE, are greater than those of the thermite mixtures and make an attractive composite. This slide shows aluminum and PTFE composites produced by mechanical attrition. The EDS map on the left shows the uniform nanoscale distribution of PTFE throughout the particles. The center plot shows a comparison of burning rates of AP-based composite propellants as a function of pressure for both 
micron aluminum and the micron aluminum PTFE composites. The particle loading was 15 weight percent by, in both cases, which is considerably higher than could be achieved if the particles were nano-sized. As can be seen, about a 30% increase in burning rate is achieved with the inclusion particles. From the photographs at the top right, you can again see that the inclusion particles burn close to the surface, whereas the micron aluminum burn far from the surface. Also evident from the captured samples of the combustion product is the fact that the composites produce smaller oxide particles, indicating the combustion of initially smaller particles and better dispersion. In many systems, the product size is important, for example, to two-phase flow losses. The hierarchical structure I've shown here for bottom-up and top-down approaches has also been achieved through micron substrates that support nanoparticles. For example, graphene sheets have been used for attaching nanoparticles and preventing them from sintering while heating and reacting. Functionalized graphene sheets are 2D polymeric aromatic hydrocarbons with micron dimensions in two directions with a surface area of 850 meters squared per gram. In this view graph, I show three examples. On the left, platinum nanoparticles were stabilized on indium tin oxide, the latter which were attached to the lattice defect sites on the functionalized graphene sheets. The platinum nanoparticles are used here as nanocatalysts, which are prevented from coarsening and sintering by being pinned to the ITO graphene junctions. In the center, polyoxometallates, a better oxidation catalyst, are attached to the oxygen and alkyl functionalities on the FGS. For both the platinum and palms, FGF loadings of 20 weight percent have been reported. In addition, alkyl chains have been grafted to the edges of the FGS to enable formation of stable colloids. On the right, the graphene sheets are used as part of the synthesis process for forming nanoaluminum from precursor micron aluminum. The nanoaluminum is formed in situ after melting the micron particles and suppressing agglomeration by using the defects and multi-layers as barriers. After formation of the nanoaluminum, the reduced graphene oxide protects the nanoaluminum from oxidation. Uh, this is an example of the use of platinum decorated FGS. Here the platinum decorated FGS was added to normal dodecane in quantities of 50 to 100 parts per million by weight. The mixture was first fed through a supercritical flow reactor simulating a high pressure fuel line and then the fuel pyrolysis products were used to feed a combustor also operating under supercritical conditions. These photographs and plots show the platinum particle attachment to the FGS before and after the pyrolysis reaction, as well as the platinum particle size distributions. As you can see, the particles remained unchanged without sintering at temperatures as high as 900 K. Most notably, as shown in this plot, the particles enhanced the decomposition of normal dodecane by about 30% and increased the selectivity of molecular hydrogen by more than 100% over the temperature range of 750 to 810 Kelvin. Molecular dynamics cal calculations are also consistent with these observed uh, enhancement of the experiments. In the first row of snapshots here, a platinum cluster is shown to enhance proton transfer, reducing the activation energy necessary to form the first alkyl radical. And the bottom sequence shows that migration of the absorbed hydrogen on the cluster followed by desorption of molecular hydrogen is responsible for the increase in hydrogen selectivity. When the outflow of the reactor was injected into the combustor, distributed ignition was observed rather than a localized ignition with subsequent flame spread. Ignition delays were shortened, flame liftoff reduced, flame spreading angle increased, and fuel conversion increased by about 35% as shown in this chart which compares results for the pure fuel, fuel with just the FGS, and the fuel with different loadings of platinum on the FGS. Note in this example, the micron particle had multifunctionality in preventing the nanoparticles from sintering, pyrolyzing the fuel, assisting ignition of the gas phase, and stabilizing the initial colloid. I wanna show one other example where 
the multi-structure was used to control reaction rate. This is an example where the fuel is silicon and the energetic composite material is formed by chemically etching small pores in the silicon and filling them with an oxidizer. However, in this example, a micron scale is also added to the structure in the shape of pillars, which are formed by a deep reactive ion etch. The synthesis process is shown on the left, starting with application of a mask, then the reactive ion etch, followed by the electrochemical etch. A side view of the pillars is shown at the top center, then below is a top view showing the array of pillars, and then at the bottom, the etched nanopores, which are about 18 nanometer in diameter. The nanopores are filled with sodium perchlorate to form a composite propellant. While shown here as a 2D structure, the structures here have also been broken up into particles. To illustrate the reaction process, a small rectangular piece of silicon was patterned to only have the microscale pillars on the top half of a thin channel. The strip was ignited at the base and a reaction propagated initially at a steady velocity of about 2.5 meters per second. The plot on the right is a distance versus time plot. And as you can see, once the reaction entered the pillars, the propagation rate increased by two orders of magnitude. The transition here is a result of the change in propagation mode from a conductive to a convective driven wave. But the importance is, again, the ability to control the reaction chemistry by the nanostructure and its relation to the microscale. Now, integration of these nanostructured micron particles into bulk materials is currently by way of conventional fabrication techniques, such as casting and extrusion. To achieve better control over the microscale, various types of additive manufacturing are now being investigated for making bulk materials. Additive manufacturing involves building 3D materials layer by layer using computer-aided design. And there are many approaches, and the choice of the method primarily depends on the material, resolution, structural integrity, cost, and in the case of energetic materials, safety. While much of the research to date has been for producing energetic materials of limited size, for example, placing energetics on an electronic chip, many of the fabrication techniques are adaptable to producing materials of a much larger scale. This is an example of a direct writing process. A uh, limitation of direct write printing of energetic materials is overcoming the large viscous losses associated with slurry extrusion through a small nozzle. These losses become larger with smaller particles and higher loadings of particles. One approach to disturbing the shear forces at the wall surface has been to introduce ultrasonic vibrations at the nozzle tip. Using such a technique, McLean and all have demonstrated printing of AP-based propellants with solid loadings as high as 85%. The propellants consisted of a bimodal distribution of AP in either hydroxyl-terminated polybutadiene resin or a UV-curable polyurethane binder. Compared to cast materials, the printed materials had higher densities and less voids. In the lower left are micro-CT scans as shown for both of the, the printed binders. The mass burning rates between the printed and cast materials were also in, in good agreement. As another example, Sandrew and all have printed propellants consisting of ammonia perchlorate, iron oxide catalyst, HTBP, fuel binder, a plasticizer, and curing agent with a solids loading of, I think, about 78%. Aluminum powder was added up to 10 weight percent of the weight of AP. Uh, freestanding, uncured grains could be printed up to 100 millimeters in height with reasonable green strength and shape fidelity. Like the work of McLean, the densities of the 3D printed material were 3 to 7 percent higher than conventional cast grains. The 3D images in the middle of the slide illustrate different printed grain shapes as well as strands printed with different porosities ranging from 30 to 90 percent fill. The ability to print 3D energetic materials provides many opportunities for co controlling grain structure and hence the burning rate. This slide shows an example of an aerosol jet form of additive manufacturing involving the cold spray process. 
A schematic of the process is shown at the top left, where an aerosol flow is accelerated through a de Laval nozzle, and the particles impinge on a substrate, resulting in layer-by-layer -layer growth of the entrained material. Because of the low temperatures and high velocities, the particles are mechanically consolidated without significant melting. The bottom left shows a photograph of cold sprayed intermetallic aluminum and nickel, where the samples were printed or sprayed as, as thick as two centimeters. In this particular study, three types of micron particles were cold sprayed. These were individual aluminum and nickel particles, nickel clad aluminum particles, and cryomilled aluminum nickel particles with nanostructure. Micrograph images of the sprayed materials are shown at the bottom right, where the, the variations in the microstructure are evident. Mixing improves in going from the separate particles to the cryomilled particles where the nanostructure was preserved. The bottom right figure shows results from homogeneous ignition experiments. This is a plot of the sample temperature versus an oven temperature, which increased at a rate of one degree C per second. As you can see, the material with the nanostructure ignited at the lowest temperature through solid state reactions. And for the other two materials, the aluminum needed to nearly melt before ignition would occur. Again, showing the importance of the nanostructure in the material. From my presentation so far, the experimental measurements that I've shown you are basically for macroscale observables. However, we know that it's the processes at the nano and micro scales that drive many of the macroscopic observables. Dynamic measurements at the nano and micro scales of energetic materials are extremely limited, and this is obviously due to the spatial and temporal timescales associated with reactions and transport processes at these scales. In addition, many of the important processes occur in the condensed phase or at interfaces. There's been advancements in diagnostics, and, and these include the experiments of Delotte on shock initiation, microscopy, the laser-induced air shock method of Gottfried, the T-jump time of flight mass spectrometry, and high-speed thermometry and microscopic experiments of Zachariah, the high-speed spectroscopy measurements above burning propellant surfaces of Luct and Sun, and the time-resolved nanosecond imaging of nanoscale condensed phase reaction studies of Lagrange. This latter example is especially interesting where transmission electron microscopy has been modified for making movies with nanoscale spatial and time resolutions. This slide shows an example of dynamic transmission electron microscopy. The photographs on the left show a six image sequence of a reaction front propagating through a titanium and boron nanolaminate film. The thin dark line at the reaction front is a short lived and inhomogeneous liquid phase. Note the propagation velocity of approximately 12 meters per second is obtained over a length scale of 10 micron and a time scale of 800 nanoseconds. The plot on the right shows the corresponding sequence of diffraction spectra collected as the reaction front passed through a two micron diameter field of view. The spectra show the transformation of an amorphous titanium boron structure to a nanocrystalline titanium diboron hexagonal crystal structure. The rates of reaction and product formation from these experiments have been used for model development and analysis of reacting boron titanium intermetallic particles. While studies such as this are encouraging Diagnostics at the nano and micro scale are still few and represent an area requiring new developments. Considering this, reactive molecular dynamics calculations are proving to be an important tool for probing behavior at these scales. The first reactive MD studies on the combustion of aluminum nanoparticles were performed on bare particles. Studies have now been extended to core shell particles where the shell is the naturally occurring oxide layer. Particle sizes have ranged from 2 to 20 nanometers and have included as much as a half a billion atoms. The example I show here is from Chuanov for an initially room temperature core shell aluminum nanoparticle placed in a high temperature oxygen environment. The results have shown that oxidation occurs through four stages consisting of particle preheating, melting, oxidation of the core aluminum, and then finally, 
oxidation of the shell. As shown in the schematic, the aluminum core starts to melt from the core shell interface with outward diffusion of core aluminum atoms into the shell. Reaction is initiated between the shell oxygen and the core aluminum atoms around the interface at the end of melting, leading to fast oxidation of the aluminum core. After this initial oxidation of the aluminum core, the oxide shell continues to react with ambient oxygen atoms until oxidation is complete. The important finding here is the role that the shell oxygen plays in oxidizing the core aluminum. During the preheating stage, fissiabsorption dominated the reaction, which gradually transitioned to chemiabsorption and reaction diffusion during the melting and shell oxidation stages. The aluminum temperature at core melting and ignition was found independent of the type of oxidizer, but the durations for preheating and melting stages were found dependent on the oxidizer as well as the aluminum nanoparticle structure during reaction. For example, because water has a stronger fizzy absorption with the particle than oxygen or CO2, nanoparticles reacting in water vapor have a shorter preheating stage and hence a shorter ignition delay. There are many other research questions that can be addressed by reactive molecular dynamics calculations. For example, studies on the particles with attached ligands. And this type of analysis will continue to play an important role. I started this lecture by saying control of energetic material sensitivity and reaction rates was the direction in which research was moving at the expense of the limited advancements in energy densities. As I hope I've shown you, the ability to build nanostructured energetic materials is generating a new operating space for the combustion of energetic materials. The presence of nanostructures is also making the ability to control sensitivity and reaction rates a greater possibility. One example is through smart polymers in which the structural modifications and responsiveness can be enhanced by nanomaterials. Many crystals and polymers of energetic materials exhibit piezoelectric behavior, which offer the potential for producing smart propellants and pyrotechniques with multifunctional capabilities that can be actively controlled via external stimuli. Electric field development in secondary explosive crystals upon static loading has been well documented for PETN and HMX. Likewise, Energetic material systems composed of the ferroelectric fluoropolymers, such as polyvinyl iodine fluoride, PVDF, have demonstrated strong piezoelectric behavior. In particular, they can build surface charge and store energy with an applied electric field that has been shown to be shear manipulated to ignition. In this view graph, samples of an energetic composite consisting of nanoaluminum and a terpolymer of tetrafluoroethylene showed increased sensitivity during drop weight testing when an implied voltage was placed across the sample. The experiment consisted of placing a sample of a nanoaluminum fluoropolymer composite between two electrodes. With and without an implied field, the height of the drop weight or impact energy that produced ignition was recorded. As shown in the center plot, as the voltage was increased, the impact energy for ignition decreased and thus its sensitivity increased. In another experiment, the sample was heated by a CO2 laser and the time for ignition was measured with and without the applied field and with and without pulling the PVDF TRFE copolymer. The bar chart on the right shows a similar result where the average ignition delay time was reduced when the samples were pulled and exposed to an applied field. Examples of how piezoelectrics could result in destructive capabilities are numerous, including opening voids that could dynamically sensitize a propellant to shock initiation and detonation, producing cracks by delamination to change propellant surface burning area, generating electrical breakdowns throughout a propellant, resulting in a volumetric explosion on demand, and altering deflagration speeds via preheating. Now, th this is just one example illustrating reaction control of energetic materials. There's been other approaches that are under study using flash heating, cool plasmas, and microwaves as examples. So I, I wanna summarize my presentation by simply saying, 
While the energetics community has lagged behind other fields in molecular sciences with regards toward the total command of chemistry over many length scales, it's evident from the examples presented here that there's been significant progress over the last 25 years in the synthesis of nanoenergetic materials in their assembly to larger scales. Macroscale formulations of energetic materials can be designed and developed that preserve the intrinsic nanoscale structure of the individual components, thus approaching the true potential of nanoscale energetic materials. The benefits in designing energetic materials over these length scales has also been evident in tailoring reaction rates, ignition temperatures, and sensitivity. Some directions forward include more functionality to enable external control of reactivity and sensitivity and inherent self-monitoring. Some of the additional studies are, that are needed are on modeling analysis and diagnostics at interfaces of energetic materials and in condensed phases at the nanometer length scale and also at very short times at the, at the nanosecond time scale. So with that, I thank you very much